Good evening and welcome to a special WDSU Commitment 2020 hot seat debate. We all know that election day is one week away, Saturday, December 5th. Tonight we are bringing you a very special debate for the top prosecutor position in the city of New Orleans, Orleans Parish District Attorney. The two top vote getters from the primary are here. You will hear from them about why they feel they're the best candidate for this office. Joining us tonight is former judge and former acting district attorney Kiva Landrum. She ran first in the primary. Also, the second place finisher, city councilman Jason Williams, also an attorney. Thank you all both for being here. We're doing almost the exact same format that we do with a lot of these debates, except this one because of COVID-19 is going to be on Zoom. So therefore, we start with opening statements and we do that alphabetically. Miss Landrum, you have 60 seconds to make an opening statement. Good evening and thank you. This Saturday, we will elect our next district attorney. And throughout this campaign, my commitment to reform has remained and my focus to making sure that we prioritize public safety has also remained. My experience, both as a former prosecutor and serving as our district attorney, makes me the best qualified candidate to be our next district attorney. I will make sure that we focus on victims who have been affected by violent crime in our community. Also, my experience as a judge allows me the experience to know how to prioritize violent crime cases in our criminal justice system. As our next district attorney, I will operate in office with fairness, integrity, transparency, and accountability. I will make sure that we prioritize violent crime, that we expand our diversion program so that we can link people with the services that they need, that we also ensure that our convictions are operated fairly and with integrity, and that we treat our tr the trauma of our children. And I humbly ask for your vote this Saturday. Thank you. All right, Ms. Landrum, thank you. Mr. Williams, you have 60 seconds also to make an opening statement. Today we stand at a critical moment in our history with a chance to bring real reform and equality to our justice system. But we cannot expect the same people who broke our legal system to be the ones to fix it. There are a number of independent news sources which highlight differences between Ms. Landrum's record and mine. I wrote the legislation to decriminalize marijuana in our city. She upcharged hundreds of misdemeanor cases and sent people to jail for just simply one joint. While I worked pro bono to free innocent men from Angola for crimes they did not commit, as a judge, she ordered an innocent man, Robert Jones, to spend an extra eight years in jail, although she was in custody of the evidence that showed he was innocent. Well, I have held police accountable as a lawyer, as a judge, and on the city council. When the NOPD beat, kicked, and spit on black RTA workers at the beach corner in front of 40 witnesses while hurling racial slurs, as interim DA, she chose not to charge them with anything. The differences are crystal clear. I'm fighting to change the system, and she is committed to the status quo and has already cut deals to keep people in place. I hope we can have just an honest dialogue about our records. These are not opinions. These are our records, and the voters deserve to hear about it. Really quickly, we are going to get the questions, but Ms. Landry, because he brought you up by name several times there, would you like to have a brief 20-second response to that? Because we are going to give you a chance to respond when one of you brings up some sort of attack on the other one. So really quickly, before we get to a question, would you like to respond to that? What I'll say is that there are indeed very stark differences about our, our candidacies, and those differences are in our integrity and our honesty and our accountability. And what I can tell you is that I, have someone, I am someone whose uh, integrity has never been questioned, my honesty has never been questioned, and my accountability has never been questioned. And you can tell that by the fact that all of his colleagues are standing with me and have endorsed my candidacy, everyone that represents the districts throughout this city. All right, thank you, Ms. Landry. Mr. Williams, we're going to start this question with you. Let's talk Cardell Hayes. One of you all is going to be the district attorney moving forward. Cardell Hayes is the man who shot and killed Will Smith, the former Saint star, and shot and injured his wife. His conviction, because it was a non-unanimous jury verdict, is going to get overturned. It was 10 to 2. One of you all will have to decide what to do with that high-profile case. So here's the question. It's almost multiple choice. We're going to give you 60 seconds to answer it, Mr. Williams. Do you drop the case? Do you let him plea as charged? time served five years and walk out or do you try to prosecute this to, to the fullest 
and sent him back to jail. What will your decision be in 60 seconds if you're elected DA moving forward with Cardell Hayes? Travis, you know how much I love you, but what I will not do is allow you to make uh, this case a campaign issue. Uh, there are a number of Ramos cases, split jury verdicts that are going to have to uh, be reviewed. And I've, I've made a, an earnest commitment uh, on several debates to review every single one of them. But I'm not about to drag these families into this campaign for DA. So I'm not going to answer that question. All right. Ms. Landrum, if you could answer that question, what would your decision be moving forward with the Cardell Hayes case? If you are elected, you will have to deal with that case. It was very high profile. Would the decision be dismiss the charges, let him plea as charged, time served, or continue to prosecute it and seek the most jail time? What would your decision be dealing with this high profile case if you're elected DA? You have 60 seconds. Well, I respect the court's decision in um, overturning the conviction and recognizing that the standard should be a unanimous jury verdict. Uh, however, in this case, at this time, we are, I'm not in a position to comment on what to do with this particular case, because if elected, that is a decision that I would have to make, uh, would have to assess the evidence in the case, assess uh, the, the, the testimony of witnesses, assess what is available uh, if we do decide to go forward. Uh, and so that is not a decision and um, a comment that can be made publicly at this time without really sitting down, looking at the case, discussing it with the victims and their families uh, as we move forward. Can you both agree right here that probably dropping the case is something that neither one of you all would do? Or is that something that's even on the table at this point really quickly? We'll start with you, Mr. Williams, since that's how we started this question. In about 20 seconds, really quickly. I, I can do it in five. I'm not going to allow this to become a campaign uh, issue on the hot seat. I, I love you, but I'm not going to do it, Travis. All right, Ms. Landrum. And I couldn't make any comment as well as to uh, what, what decisions would be made. All right, Ms. Landrum, we're going to start this question with you. It's a pointed question. Your opponent just brought it up. There are attack ads and flyers out there right now against you saying that when you were the acting DA over a decade ago in 07 and 08, some of your sentencing methods were draconian dealing with marijuana cases. If you could address that issue in about 90 seconds right now, were your sentencing methods draconian back then? And how do you defend these allegations against you? Well, first and foremost, uh, as the acting district attorney, I was not responsible for any sentencing of any cases. However, I think that there has been some discussion about um, any policies about how we accepted marijuana cases. Uh, under my uh, supervision as the acting district attorney, I was charged with clearing up a backlog of cases that existed. And some of those were marijuana cases uh, that the police department had referred to the office under the prior administration. It was my directive to screen, those, to screen that backlog and get rid of it. And so in doing so at the time, second offense marijuana was in fact a felony. It has been my position and I pledge to the citizens of New Orleans that under my administration, we will not prosecute possession of marijuana cases. And so this criticism really uh, is of no moment because my commitment to how we are going to proceed and move forward uh, on possession of marijuana cases is what counts now. That was the law then, this is the law now and how we're going to proceed. And this is just Mr. Williams's attempt to try and connect me to any prior administration and try to, uh, deceive the citizens of New Orleans. All right, here's a question for you, Mr. Williams. We all know that you are facing a federal indictment right now for tax-based charges. When we did this debate about a month ago, actually less than a month ago, you said Bill Barr and President Donald Trump were out to get you, you had a target on your back. The fact that Donald Trump has now been elected out of office, Joe Biden will be the president. Do you think they dropped the charges against you? And if they don't, then how do you defend those allegations if Donald Trump and Bill Barr in the foreseeable future are not going to be in office anymore? You have 90 seconds to answer that question. Travis, I, I tell you this, I am completely innocent of these allegations. Uh, I was investigated, investigation started uh, three days after I announced uh, that was an, it was an FBI investigation. It started three days after I announced I was running uh, almost two years ago. Uh, you heard at the last hearing, because I know you were on the Zoom call before Judge Feldman, that the FBI agent said to the IRS, IRS agent in charge, they found nothing in my background and they looked everywhere. And we also know that a week before this case kicked off, there was uh, an IRS case brought with this indictment that we're talking about now. Uh, 
a week before qualifying. And the first day of early voting, Bill Barr comes down and gives a speech to law enforcement folks saying, do not elect progressive DAs. I am gonna be vindicated of the charges against me. These charges are false, they're, they're, they're politically motivated, and, 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 and the record is gonna show that because I've seen the evidence. But let me be very clear, a false allegation is not gonna stop me, it hasn't scared me. I'm gonna to continue to fight to change this system. But when we talk about the record of, 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 of myself at city council, or the record of Ms. Landrum as a judge or interim DA, that is not an attack. And that is not coming from me. That is people reading transcripts. That is the Times Picayune. you. Uh, those are. Hang on, we got a lot more to get to. We're actually gonna start this question with you, Mr. Williams. Let's talk about the office's finances. We all know that the city of New Orleans, to put it mildly, is cash strapped amid the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of the DA's funding comes through the city of New Orleans. In 60 seconds, Mr. Williams, what is your plan to make sure that this office, if elected, stays financially viable? I'm gonna do, Travis, the same thing that single moms have been doing for years. I'm gonna trim the fat. I'm gonna make sure that the office is nimble. Uh, I, I, I've looked at the DA's budget every single year as a council member at large. And I've also looked at the sheriff's budget, uh, OPD's budget and the court's budget. And I've been able to see that the architect, who I believe is a DA uh, of, the, of, the, of the criminal legal system, is driving up the costs that we spend uh, from general fund dollars to the criminal legal system. There are a number of lawyers who are getting paid close to $100,000 that don't do any work at Tulane and Broad. Uh, I've already talked to some of the, the folks who have brought lawsuits against the office for wrongful convictions, and they are willing to have conversations about sell it, settling them for less uh, while the DA right now is spending close to a half a million dollars a year just defending these lawsuits in which he knows he's wrong. So there's a lot of fat to trim. Ms. Landrum, same exact question. City is cash strapped. That could affect the DA's office. If you're elected, what is your plan in 60 seconds to make sure the DA's office stays financially viable? So it's definitely going to take reallocating resources and restructuring the office, you know, but I think the bigger question is, you know, what has happened in this last uh, city council budget hearing in this last cycle, because uh, my opponent here uh, took a first stab at the district attorney's office's budget. And he talks about, you know, he was digging in and he studied it line by line, but it's not about studying the budget. It is about actually knowing the work of the district attorney's office. And so when he suggested a parity for the district attorney and the public defender's office, let me be clear. I believe that every office and every um, entity in this system should be operated and funded fully to the extent of the work that they do. But the parity speaks to his lack of experience and lack of knowledge about the district attorney's office. Trying to compare these offices apples to apples is just inappropriate and not right. The office's functions don't mirror each other. The district attorney's office runs a diversion program, an economic crime unit, child support, all of which the, the, the public defender's office does not have. And so these things have um, affected the budget of the district attorney's office. Really quickly, sure, since she brought you up by name, if you can have that. about 10 seconds, Mr. Williams, to respond to that since she brought you up by name. Fairness, equity in the criminal legal system, that has to happen. That is not something you try to figure out down the road after somebody spent 20 years in jail because of a wrongful conviction. When people say the things that Kiva Landrum just said, what they're saying is they see the system, but one side is being more important than the other. Absolutely Both sides not. Have to be what clear. I said is that Both when you have, have to, to when you, you you have to see the system for how it is, and each person should be funded for the work that they do fully. But you can't compare something when it is not apples to apples when it's not that they don't have a mirror image, and that speaks to the inexperience and his lack of knowledge about the actual work of the district attorney. Okay. Yeah. Travis, Absolutely. both officers are fighting for the people of this city, no matter where you look at but it. But one both does, this one tells does you a lot work about, outside of criminal justice. This tells you a lot about how she sees the system. One Travis. does work outside this tells you a whole of criminal lot about how she sees the system. It tells you it really the fact does. that you are very inexperienced about the entirety and the extremeness of the work of the district attorney. They work in This is why court. she's already taken they my does. presumption of innocence away the same way she took Robert Jones's no. presumption. What it is, is Mr. Williams, is because she sees the DA's work. If you continue to find yourself as a victim, you're asking the citizens of New Orleans to be embattled in your legal battle, which is extremely unfair and selfish, 
This is not our battle to fight with you, sir. You have every bit of the presumption of innocence, but you should fight that battle alone and it should not be the citizens of New Orleans fighting it with you. All right. Uh, so we could talk all day about this. We appreciate your commentary here because it is a hot button topic. We do have to move on to another topic, but just to point out, you all are both running for the top prosecutor spot in the city of New Orleans. The public defender is appointed. That is Derwin Button. The bulk of his funding does come from the state of Louisiana, and he does get some from the city of New Orleans. Mr. Williams, we're going to start this Thank question you, with you. Thank let's you for talk, that clarification. Let's talk about juvenile crime in the city of New Orleans. In 60 seconds here, give us what you feel like is the most, the most effective program at the Youth Study Center and why you think that should continue right now in 60 seconds. I'm gonna be honest with you, Travers. I can't say there's a program that's the most effective. There are not enough effective programs. Kids aren't, aren't cars. There's not, a one sil there's not one silver bullet for our children. We just have to make sure that, that, that along uh, the scale of, 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 of no jail time and jail time, that we have a continuum of intervention services ranging from uh, mental health, trauma, uh, addiction. Uh, we need organizations like Son of a Saint and Youth Empowerment Project helping us with our young people so that we can give them on ramps to success rather than funneling them into the system or setting them up for failure on their own. Same, same question, Ms. Landrum, 60 seconds. Give us what you feel is the most effective program at the Youth Studies Center and why dealing with juvenile crime. Well, right now, what I think is that we do have to revamp how we've been dealing with uh, the children in our criminal justice system. First and foremost, we have to identify the adult actors that are pulling our kids into this criminal justice system and hold them accountable for their role in these actions. And then we have to start dealing with the trauma that these children have been uh, experiencing due to the fact that there is some lack of support either in the home, in the environment that surrounds them, or from these activities. And so what I pledge to do is to dig deep figure out what that trauma is and meet our kids where they are. And if that means bringing those services to their schools, to their homes, to um, extracurricular activities so that we can treat them and support them and support their families, that is what I am going to do as our next district attorney. We have to have viable options for our kids outside of incarceration. I'm going to make sure that we do that, bring all of our community actors to the table. We have these things already in place. We just have not been linking our kids with these services. All right, really quickly, in about 30 seconds here, Ms. Landrum, if a 15-year-old gets caught, let's just say a dozen times, and this has happened in the city of New Orleans, stealing and breaking into cars, in about 60 seconds here, how do you move forward prosecuting a case like that against a 15-year-old who seems to be a habitual car burglar that violates people's property and steals it in the city of New Orleans? How do you move forward with that case? So what I know is that, you know, when we are dealing with these car burglaries, you know, in the past, my opponent had mentioned that those were nuisance crimes. And we know that those simply are not nuisance crimes. And they are, in many ways, they have become to uh, endanger the public safety of the citizens of New Orleans. Uh, many of these have led to where the citizens have engaged in gun battles with uh, some of our juveniles. It is going to be important to figure out uh, the adult actors that are leading these kids into this criminal activity. Children aren't just breaking into cars just to break in. They're searching for guns, and oftentimes they're uh, looking for uh, drugs involved, uh, anything that they can use and bring back to these adult actors. So what I'm going to do is make sure that I partner with the law enforcement agencies so that we can identify the adults. We are then going to um, get these children, uh, look at what is going on in the environments that is surrounding them. If it is their parents that are pulling them into, that, into this activity, we're going to hold the parents accountable and then treat the children for what is happening in their lives. All right, same question, Mr. Williams. If you have to deal with a case with a 15-year-old who seems to be a habitual car burglar and car thief, how do you prosecute that case moving forward if you're the DA? Humanely, Travis, uh, and following the law. I'm going to do it in juvenile court. I'm going to allow the young person to stay in juvenile custody if it shows that they are a danger to the community. But there are a number of other robust steps that we can take to make sure that this young person, if he is released, is monitored on a regular basis. The other piece of this thing, Travis, is getting into schools. I've been speaking to young people and speaking to educators about why, about the root causes of why young people are breaking into cars. And what we found out is that young people are selling guns on the black market to just a select few of adults. I'm gonna also go after those adults and prosecute them. 
And if a young person is out after curfew, I'm going to also have some, some, some serious intervention with their parents about why a 14-year-old is out the streets at 11 o'clock at night. All right, two quick questions here, and then we're going to have closing statements. Really quickly, we'll start with you, Mr. Williams. I know both of you all are fine Tulane Law School <laughs> grads. Give the police chief, Sean Ferguson, a letter grade like a teacher, A, B, C, D, or F. You can't give him an incomplete, Mr. Williams. What is your letter grade for the police chief? Uh, it's not my job to, to, to give a letter grade. It's my job to, to work with him uh, and correct him when he's wrong and assist him to be better. Ms. Landrum, can you give him a letter grade? Incomplete's not an option. A, B, C, D, or F? Well, I wouldn't um, give a letter, but what I'd say is that I think that our police officers are working extremely hard uh, and are diligent in the work that they're doing, trying to combat the crime that we have. It is going to be important as our next district attorney to work with them and partner with them to prioritize violent crime in our community. And so that is what I pledge to do to make right. sure that uh, we can make New Orleans a very safe city. All right. Yes or no, Ms. Landrum, really quickly here. There is a high profile case that will come up before one of you all. It's the Darren Bridges case. He is accused of killing a New Orleans police officer, Marcus McNeil. Should the death penalty be sought in that case? Yes or no, Ms. Landrum? Well, what I know is that New Orleans juries have uh, rejected the death penalty uh, for multiple years now. And so we know that that is something that is a waste of resources. Uh, it does not deter uh, from criminal activity and it does not bring healing to the victim's families. And so I would say that uh, in any case that we are not going to seek the death penalty because it is not something that the New Orleans juries are willing to, uh, to return a verdict. Mr. Williams, really quickly, yes or no, should that be a death penalty?